Supercar's engines died from a high-powered whine to a whistling hum, sank to a murmur, and finally faded. Mike Mercury was home and looking forward to Christmas with all its fun and celebrations. He climbed out of the cockpit, already thinking of prime turkey and mince pies. Mike! Mike! Come and look at our latest invention! Suddenly all thoughts of food vanished. Somehow Mike was no longer certain that Christmas would be the happy, carefree affair that he had imagined. That shouting and yelling from the laboratory told him that the scientists were at work, and once Dr. Beaker and Professor Popkiss put their heads together, anything could happen, and it usually did. This is my, um, greatest invention yet, Mike. That was Dr. Beaker's voice. And it works! We've tested it thoroughly! Added Professor Popkiss. They really seem to be onto something this time, thought Mike as he moved towards the workshop. As he entered the workshop, he thought for an instant that he had gone into the kitchen by mistake, and he found himself thinking of food again, for his nostrils were suddenly filled with the aroma of roast turkey with stuffing. Then he blinked in amazement at what he saw. There on the workbench, amid pliers, a hammer, wire, screws, bent nails, bits of tin, a bucket from the garden and an old television tube, was the most fat, brown, glistening, steaming, delicious-looking turkey Mike had ever seen in his life. What did you, um, think of it, Mike, eh? Beaker gurgled, obviously very proud of himself. What an, uh, invention! Most, um, satisfactory! It's a fine turkey, Mike agreed, so as not to hurt the inventor's feelings. But roast turkey was invented when the Pilgrim Fathers landed in America. That's if invented is the right word to use. Beaker raised his arms in exasperation. Explain it to him, Popkiss, he said. I think it will be better if we show him. Think of a food, Popkiss challenged him. A carrot, Mike retorted. One cup of, um, earth should be enough, mumbled Beaker, using a teacup to dig earth out of the garden bucket. It was not until the doctor began tipping the earth into a wide funnel that Mike noticed what the scientists had meant by their invention. It was not the turkey at all, but a strange contraption of metal and wire beside it. There was the funnel at one end into which Beaker was dispensing the earth, then a complicated tangle of pipes, with glass bubble valves, and a built-in typewriter keyboard, then more tubes and wires ended in something which could only be described as an oven. Popkiss rattled the keyboard, the contraption seeming to groan, gurgle, hiss and clank. Finally there was a clunk, and the oven door swung open to reveal a carrot. A splendid orange-red, full-length carrot, reposing on the oven floor. There you are, Mike, announced Beaker triumphantly. We made it. We have, um, invented a machine that makes food out of earth. And it's good food, interrupted Popkiss. We've tested it for everything, by photoanalysis, chemical analysis, by neutron refraction, by specific gravity. We've tested for chemical composition, nuclear disposition, radioactivity, for vitamins, proteins, calories. Okay, okay, I believe you, Mike cried with a desperate note of surrender in his voice. We'll take it along to the United Nations the morning after Boxing Day. But where are Jimmy and Mitch? He asked, realizing he had not seen them. Oh, we sent them to the living quarters to fix the Christmas decorations, Beaker announced. We daren't risk having a boy and a chimpanzee around whilst we were inventing food. They would eat it faster than we could make it. The living quarters were decorated, all right. Jimmy had managed to string a few paper chains across the ceiling, whilst Mitch seemed to have tangled the remainder around and under the furniture. Mike could not help laughing at the scene, but soon lent a hand to restore order to the chaos. As he was doing so, a news flash came over the television. It seems as though the inhabitants of the island of Shan will go without their Christmas dinner this year. A heavy storm is raging along the western coast, and the monthly supply ship has reported engine trouble. Mike turned off the set. Forget the decorations, Jimmy. We're going to take those islanders Dr. Beaker's latest invention so they can enjoy their Christmas after all. In a shabby room, in a tumble-down building not far from the home of Supercar, Master Spy, Mike Mercury's arch-enemy, took off a set of headphones and chuckled evilly to Zarin, his cunning assistant. Hehe, <laughs> I wonder how long it will be before Mike Mercury discovers that I have planted a secret microphone inside his television set, so that I can listen to every word spoken in his living quarters. Go and hire a helicopter, came Master Spy's command. We're going to Shan to steal that food machine. 
the directors of duper supermarkets will pay us a fortune for a machine that can make food out of dirt. Mike Mercury and Jimmy had set up Dr. Beaker's weird apparatus in the church hall at Sharn, and by Christmas Eve morning, they had begun to turn the local earth into seasonal fare that the stricken supply boat had failed to bring. Mitch, put down those bananas, yelled Mike as the thieving chimp ran up the side of the stage to peel his pillaged bananas. Never mind, Jimmy said with a laugh. We can make some more. Ouch! Mitch had taken one bite of a banana and had hurled the rest of the bunch at his friend. Then in a fearful chimpanzee rage, he leaped up and down on the stage and began flinging the other bananas, nuts and cakes furiously around the hall. Pandemonium broke loose. Mike and Jimmy rushed at the chimp. He dodged them. The islanders joined in the chase as the angry Mitch ran amok with a large bag of machine-made Brazil nuts as ammunition. It was at the height of the confusion that two sinister figures sneaked in through the stage door, grabbed up the food machine between them and ran for their lives. Mike Mercury lost no time in giving chase in supercar, but there was little he could do until Master Spy decided to land the helicopter of his own free will, for if Mike forced it down into the sea, he would not only dispose of his enemies, but the food machine as well. The three-day storm was raging with added fury, and the helicopter, heavily laden with a weighty food machine, made little progress against the gale-force winds. It was as much Master Spy could do to crash-land the aircraft on a nearby barren rock, snapping off the rotor blades through nearly landing too close to a cliff. Mike was actually swooping to the rogue's rescue when a distress rocket popped feebly against the ragged horizon. It was the supply ship. Master Spy and Zarin will come to no immediate harm on that island, Mike thought. I'd better do what I can to help that ship. It's sure in a bad way. There was only one thing to do. Supercar would have to take the ship in tow. The murky grey hours of daylight had darkened gloomily into the inky rain-lashed eternity of a winter's night before the crippled vessel entered the merciful haven of Shan Sound. Then with her safely moored against the sheltering quay, the islanders toiled until well past midnight to unload their Christmas fare. By Christmas morning the storm had eased its fury, and Mike and Jimmy were more than welcome at the islanders' festivities. This really is a merry Christmas, proclaimed Mike. Everyone is enjoying themselves. Even Master Spy and Zaring might be a bit cold, but at least the food machine will give them plenty of tasty food to eat. I doubt it, piped up Jimmy. We found out why Mitch got so angry when he ate one of those machine-made bananas. You did? said Mike with interest. Yes, Mike. You see, those two crazy scientists tested that food in every scientific way they knew. But they forgot the most important test of all. They did? Popkiss forgot to test his food for taste. It was made from Earth, and it all tasted like Earth. <laughs>